I believe that moms show a portrait of God. It is one of the reasons why there are a couple photo booths set up for you moms and uh, your families if you want to, you haven't already, maybe got here early enough to get a good picture and um, with everyone dressed up. And, uh, but right after service, you can do that as well. I'm, Mother's Day is a very special day for me because um, I'm, I stand here as a product of not just my mother's faith, but my grandmother's faith. I wanted to show you a couple pictures because you've never got a chance to meet them. You never will. This was my grandmother. This is Mary Carroll. Um, that's probably 17, 18, like a, like a high school graduation picture that we still have. So that's Mary Carroll. This is my mom. This is, was Marian, it was Mary Elizabeth, and this is Marian Elizabeth Carroll, and that was her high school graduation picture. Um, what's interesting about this picture here, first of all, to prove that spaghetti suppers were not invented in this decade, <laughs> that this is in the basement of the church. I grew up in Bordentown, New Jersey. Yes, that is a black cast iron stove, gas stove in the background. And the reason why I wanted to show you this is because here was my grandmother on the left, and she was, she was the church cook, okay? So, like, whatever was cooked, my grandmother was, was doing the cooking or leading. And then you see, this is my mom here. But my grandmother passed away at, um, I think she was 52 years old or something like that. And uh, so, in, like, it was 1972, she passed away. And mom was only... I mean, I was, I was, I think, eight, and mom was 28, okay? So this woman on the right, her name is Angie Muni, and Angie Muni's family was from Sicily, and Angie had, had came over from Sicily as a teenager, and Angie took on the mother role from my grandmother to my mom. So you talk about the value of the local church. When my mom loses her mom too young, then Angie steps in, and Angie taught my mom how to make that sauce, and my mom taught my wife how to make that sauce. So I still eat very, very, very good pasta, okay? I still really do. So the next picture is, um, yeah. You're laughing at the hat, aren't you? Right? The, hat, the hat's what you're laughing at? Apparently... And, and if you only, if, mom, if you have sons, you, you, you understand this picture, that when you want a picture with your son, when he starts getting to a certain age, there is some element of rebellion, even though they take the picture, right? And so that's me, and that's mom. I have no idea, I have no idea what that occasion was, um, but um, I just love that expression. Uh, next picture, this was, this was Easter 1965. I was a little over one year old. Um, Eastern New Jersey is still cold. Um, I have no idea whose house that is. Um, <laughs> Mom just wanted a photo op. And, um, and then this one here, this last one, would be uh, my mom and Annie. And, um, and so mom passed away when Annie was four or five. And so this is one of, the, um, one of our last pictures um, where mom was kind of real healthy. Um, when, when Annie was born, thank you, Steve, when Annie was born, my mom gave us a video camera. Now, to say give and my mom is a kind of a complicated um, thing because it, it, came with, it came with this note that said, these are very expensive. <laughs> so in order for you to repay me for this camera, I expect one video per month. Now, we got this when she was born. So she said, we want one video per month. They were still living in New Jersey. And as if that should have been enough, right? But my mom continued. And when that first video doesn't come, you will receive a bill for the prorated amount of the camera. <laughs> and she was completely serious. Now, the beauty of that, the, the idea of moms capturing, capturing moments, is we have a lot of moments with Annie. And Mom and Dad got a chance to experience a video a month for, we, I guess you did it almost two years, until we finally figured out probably the camera was paid for. Um, and we have those, we have those moments um, as well. Uh, Woodrow Wilson declared the first Mother's Day, May 9th, 1914, and I think it's probably because he forgot to get her a card. 
I think there was probably it was much easier for him to do it in executive order. But what a Mother's Day present he would have given to set aside a day every year to thank and, and as a nation, as a thank you um, and an appreciation and a recognition for what moms bring to the world. You are special. You, you, you are unique in what you bring to families. You are unique what you bring to your children. And regardless of how culture changes and shifts and how we redefine family, the mom the, is, a, is a crucial part. Raising e- children is no easy task. The weight, the responsibility can be overwhelming. In large measure, how our children turn out is determined by how we walk with, what we sow into, and how we model to our kids. I believe that it takes a lot to raise a kid, but at the same time, the uniqueness of a mom is important. You can see, even in professional sporting events, you can see the difference between a mom and a dad pretty readily. If their son or or daughter is playing, and either whether it's college or high school or anything, the dad generally you see him on camera standing very stoic. He might have the hat on of the team, but dad's going to be stoic. Mom, shoot, she's decked out in gear, right? She's got the hat and she's got the jersey and she's got the picture on the you know on the stick and you know and and she's jumping up and down and I mean moms are going to enter. Injury happens, dad's still deadpan, right? Stoic. My kid's tough. Yeah, that's what I raised. I raised her. I raised him to be tough. Dad's stoic. Mom, head is buried in the hands. You know, she's crying because that's her baby. <laughs> On the field? Yeah. I, I remember once in Little League getting hurt, and all I heard reverberating from the crowd was, that's my baby. <laughs> Stopped asking her to come to games after that. The most famous of moms, at least in terms of maybe recognition or notoriety, would be, would be Mary, Jesus' mom. And I honestly can say I've never, I've never preached or dissected Mary's role in Jesus' life until today. And I was, I was very encouraged by how I walked through this. The Catholic tradition doesn't worship Mary, but she's a saint. But they do pray to Mary. They do honor Mary as they do all the other saints. Now, where the Catholic Church might carry their adoration a little too far, maybe, as, a, as Protestants, I don't think we carry it far enough. I mean, well, there, there, there was something unique about Mary that would have caused God to have chosen her to raise, to birth um, Jesus. Uh, we don't get an opportunity to watch a monthly video of Jesus we don't get an opportunity to watch how Mary and Joseph parented, but they, I believe there's enough glimpses in just a few scriptures that can give us an idea maybe even as a, a pattern or things that we can hold on to as we and as moms as you raise your, raise your kids. So right now I just called them basically some three, three parenting T's from Mary. The first one is that Mary treasured memories. Mary treasured memories. Look in Luke 2, 15 through 19. I'll have it on the screen, but if you brought your Bibles or your phones, you can look there. So when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, Mary didn't have to be convinced by the angels that, um, by the shepherds, that Jesus was the Messiah. I think the idea that she had a child without being married and without having sex, that she pretty much knew that this this little boy um, was something different. But the the grammatical implications of, of the imperfect tense here is that she she kept on keeping these things together so at the very beginning if you ever got frustrated like I was with moms taking pictures there is something in a in a mom that wants to capture moments they capture moments and they treasure moments and I believe we capture them differently than dads do I think dads we, we think of events but for for a for a mom everything is an event with a child it seems and so, but Mary even shows us here that she begins to, 
treasure these up. And I started thinking, what was she treasuring up? What kind of things was Mary keeping inside? you got to believe one of the things she keeps inside is the first time the angel shows up and says, Mary, you're highly favored. And you're going to give birth to a son, and he's going to be the Messiah. I believe she's treasuring up those things. I think it was, it's reasonable to think that she's treasuring up. I mean, if you've been told that you're going to give birth to the Messiah, I believe that Mary, by just her nature as moms, <laughs> um, she's searching the Old Testament scriptures trying to find out what's going to go on and what's going to happen. And then what, what about when she comes across the scripture that says that he would be born in Bethlehem and they're nowhere near there? And then there's a census called. And Joseph comes in and says, I hate to tell you this, Mary. I know the last thing you want to do is get on a donkey and travel. But we're going to have to because there's a census and we have to get to Bethlehem. I can, see, I can see the mom that has already packed. The mom that's already put the satchel together and said, yeah, I know. I know, Joseph. You're not telling me anything new. I believe she's treasuring those things up in her heart. The, the shepherds had no motivation to, to, for this act other than they, got, they saw angels. And I believe she's treasuring those things in her heart. She's building these memories. She's building... Um, and then in Luke 2, 42 and 50, 41 through 52, we find her using these words again. Now, it's just 22 verses ahead, but we skip 12 years of Jesus' life. Okay, 22 verses, 12 years. Verse 41, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Again, mom is the one doing the talking here, isn't she? Why we were searching for me, he's, why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. That's a significant, that's a significant phrase. But his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. She's still continuing to build up these memories, these memories of not just insignificant acts, but treasuring up how her son is growing, how he's changing. And it was important to her. Elizabeth Stone is an author. She has this quote. She says, making the decision to have a child is momentous. It is to decide forever to have your heart going walk, go walking around outside of your body. And I believe moms hold that to be very, very true. That to have a son or daughter is to then watch their heart walk outside of their body. I don't believe treasuring is a quirky trait of a mom. I believe it becomes a parenting priority with a mom. So, so treasuring is a part of a natural thing. If you are with your moms today, uh, give them some slack. Let, let them take their picture today. Mary trained. The second T is that Mary trained early. And she trained consistently. Trained early, she trained consistently. Luke 2, 21. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus. The name of the angel had given them before he was conceived. So at the very beginning, they're following the law. At the very beginning, circumcision was a tie to Abraham and the covenant. And so even before, it's, it, 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 it is it is not unlike what we've done today in the sense that the children will not remember the fact that they stood in front of a congregation, they were prayed over, and they were dedicated. But it was a decision of family members to say, we're going to start this path off right here. Well, what I really love is even the, it's, it's, it's saying, I might not have started out my path here, but we're going to start out this journey together here. You see the significance? It's saying, I, I'm not sure where my life has run and why it has run that, but to the best of my ability, you're not going to fall in the same holes I fell in. And so from a very, very early age, Joseph and Mary have started this part. 
What about you go on a little further, Luke 2, 22 through 24, and then 39 and 40 says this, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves and two young pigeons. Verse 39, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became stronger, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. So early, then about a month later, after the circumcision rites, they would bring the child to the temple. This is very consistent with Jewish law here. They would have been very poor, so the very poor would have given some birds as an offering, a consecration, a setting apart from the Lord. See, what, what I believe Mary and Joseph was doing was saying, you know what, this, this religion, this faith we have, Judaism, is not a dead rote religion. It's not dead rote. It's not a series of laws that you just follow. We believe this. This is true. This has shaped our life, and it's going to shape yours. So from the get-go, we're going to start this process. Then I believe she consistently followed the law. When you looked at that passage we read then when they went down to the temple, it wasn't easy, even though it was required by law that the Jewish families would, would attend three major festivals, um, uh, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And it would have been difficult if you did not live in Jerusalem to make all of those trips, but yet if you were going to make one, you were going to make the Passover one. And so here... They consistently, we find 12 years later, they, they're going to the temple. And this one's recorded because Jesus would have been reached the age of 12. He would have reached the age where he would have become starting to become responsible for his own understanding of the law and his own obedience of the law. And we find this transition taking place in Jesus' life as he recognizes that he is becoming someone different. Mary and Joseph start to recognize he's becoming someone different. But isn't it cool? I mean, it's, it was cool to me that the fact is Jesus didn't say, hey, do you understand that I'm the Messiah? And y'all need to go on. I'll catch up. It says that he was obedient. He was obedient to them. And he left and he continued to grow in stature of the Lord. So for the students in the room today, I know that you think you're old enough. But there is, there is an honor to be had by obeying and following mom and dad. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, Mary would have understood what Moses was saying. Moses said, be careful. These are the parental advice given to all of Israel. Be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Moses is giving this, these precepts because they're about to enter into a new world. They were going to leave this family nomenclature of wandering around together and they were going to enter the promises that God had given. But the promises that God had given was a new world. They were going to be entering this promised land full of nations and families that did not believe the way they believed. They were worshiping many, many, many different gods. And each family and each nation that they would go into, each tribe would have had their own different worship rites to their own different gods. And Moses is preparing them, listen, we're going to, you're going to leave, we're going to be leaving this sheltered community and we're going to be going into this new world. And when we go into this new world, you're going to need to do these things, mom and dads. If you don't, then what's going to happen is everyone's going to fall away. It doesn't take much news watching. It doesn't take much emails from school systems to understand that our kids are even in a world differently than the world you and I grew up in. But listen, I believe that God equipped me for that world, and I believe he equips them for that world, okay? And I believe that he uses moms and dads to prepare them for that world. But let's, let's look what he had to say. Be careful. Or you will be enticed, you will be drawn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will shut up the heavens so that it will not rain and the ground will yield no produce. And you will soon perish from the good land the Lord has given you. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds and tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on the foreheads. 
Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So pretty much he's saying do it continually. Write them on the door frames of your houses, on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land of the Lord, sworn to give you your ancestors, as many as the day of the heavens are above the earth. The number one precept that they were to teach them was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And dear mom, I believe that the first, the first indication of the love of God does get expressed through you. Next Sunday, I'm going to be baptizing, I don't know, there's, I think 14 or 15 people, and a lot of them are children. And so I say to moms and dads of this congregation, bravo. Bravo. Because you're demonstrating to them what a love relationship with God and what it looks like. And that we're not following some dead, rote religion with some kind of precepts. That we're following a living God and we're giving Him our hearts. I've heard people say that lessons are caught more than taught. And I would say that our faith in Christ is taught and caught simultaneously. And if I can brag on my wife, I believe, I believe Annie learned much early on the love of Jesus more from my wife than she ever did from me. I, I mean, I'll just tell you just how dads think or maybe how I think. I remember, I don't know, she's probably, I don't even know how old she was, and I'm heading out on a Saturday at Home Depot. And Gina stops me. She probably remembers, you remember? And she said, well, why don't you take Annie with you? And I said, why? <laughs> I, taking... Taking this baby with the diaper bag had absolutely no implication to anything I had planned on doing that day. She brought nothing to the table. There was no advice. She couldn't carry anything, right? <laughs> there, was, there was no service that she was going to offer. And, and the stunned look on her face and said, why? Because you can have her with you today. I have her with me every day. You, you need to take her with you today. I went, Okay. You know, and, you know, and it wasn't that I think that she wanted to break. It was, look, you're missing some of this stuff that I get to do. And until you do it, you won't realize what joy it brings when, when it's done. Take her with you today. Moms have this unique way of communicating. I believe Annie learned more about being in love with God by reading the Bible, by watching her mom. I believe she's learned more about the love of God through prayer from her mom. So you, you have a slacker. You said, Pastor, are you a slacker in your home? I'm, what, what I'm saying is until she got to be certain ages and recognized where and how I did some of those things, Gina was the one out front doing them. Moms, you may be the first people, that your identity that you have in Christ, to pass that on to your kids. So... So Mary treasured this unique thing about moms. She treasured these little, these little moments have significance. I'll get to them in a minute because they're not just photo ops. And they treasure. And then moms train. The, the, the importance of you training and training on an ongoing basis is, is significant. And then I believe one thing that Mary, the last thing that Mary demonstrates that we should grab a hold on is Mary trusted who Jesus had become. Okay, this is her son. She trusted who Jesus had become, and she trusted that God the Father would complete what he started. Follow me? Mary trusted who Jesus had become. One of the more interesting chapters in Scripture is John chapter 2. In John chapter 2, Jesus had already been baptized, had already called his disciples. But in John chapter 2, Jesus and the disciples and Mary, they're at a wedding. And at this wedding, had to be close friends in the village, probably. At this wedding, the bridegroom, the family that was responsible for all the festivities. Have you ever been, anyone been to a Jewish wedding? Okay. Any other culture's wedding, too? Generally, they are, right? Ours is 15 minutes, sign the, right? sign the document, let's move on, right? But weeks on end, and to run out of wine wouldn't just have been a faux pas. This would have been something pretty serious. And so <laughs> Jesus is attending the wedding as a guest, and Mary 
comes to Jesus and says, hey, this family has run out of wine. Jesus' response is, and it, it's not negative the way she, he says it, but it does indicate something. Woman, why are you telling me? Why, why, why are you involving me in this? It's not my time yet. And I, lo- I love the way, read it in John chapter 2, I love what happens next. She hears what he has to say, and then she turns around. I mean, I can see just going, mm. and she turns around to these servants, and she says, just do whatever he tells you to do. And she leaves. <laughs> this is a true mom, isn't it? She hears from her son or daughter, no, we can't, you know, everybody, she, yeah, okay, hey, you guys take care of it. And, and she's out the door, and so, so Jesus, you know, I mean, I don't know what his expression is. He looks at the servants and go get some clay pots. And he goes get six 20 to 30 gallon pots used for, for, for cleansing. And they bring them to him. He says, okay, dip, dip, dip one out. They dip one out, now it's wine. Go take it to the bridegroom. Go take it to the, and they take the wine. And then he said, wait, this is better than the first stuff we put out. We, we're supposed to save, you know, we're supposed to save the good stuff. You know, we, we do the good stuff at the beginning and then the bad stuff at the end when they can't taste the difference, Right? And here is the first recorded miracle of Jesus. First recorded miracle of Jesus, Jesus doesn't seem to want to do. Why does it get done? You're saying that Mary told Jesus what to do? Here's, what, here's kind of how I shook out on it. Mary, like most moms, they know when it's time. She had been sowing into Jesus. She knew he was the Messiah. She understood the compassion that he had in his heart. And pretty much in this time, she's saying, you know what? I think it's time. And I think inside, you know, to Jesus to respond like that, I think inside he's going, yep, it is. You're talking about trust? You're trusting your son to turn nothing into something. The trust that we have dads, but moms, the trust that you have in your kids, you can't measure the importance of that. My mom believed I could go to Princeton. Thank you for not laughing. (laughs) Princeton was about 45 minutes where I grew up, and mom just hounded me to send my test scores to Princeton. To this day, I believe if you could interview her picture, she believed her son could have gone to Princeton. Believe me, I could not have gone to Princeton. I could have gone to Princeton. Couldn't have graduated from Princeton. But there was something I still remember to this day, 51, that mom wanted me to send my test course to Princeton. There was a trust. I know what I've put in you. I know what God's put in you. And no one else may see it, but I see it. I mean, isn't that what Mary's saying at that wedding? No one else might see that you're the Messiah and you can do miracles, but I do. I see it. Son, take care of it. So there is a trust that we have in our kids that's significant. But there is even a deeper trust. John chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, where is your son? And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. So what's happening here is Jesus is on the cross. John, the writer of this gospel, is with Mary, these Marys, and Mary of Jesus, uh, mother of Jesus. And he's hanging on the cross, and he knows, obviously, right, this is it. John was very close to him, and he says, Hey, Mom, this now is your son, John. John, look after Mom. See, what kind of trust we have to have, ladies specifically, because I think you deal with more anxiety around your kids. Your your husbands hide it better. You don't hide it all that well. Is that at the end of the day, we've got to trust what God has for our kids. And her trust was so great that she could stand at the foot of the cross of her firstborn and say, Lord, I trust you. If you go back to the beginning of Luke, when the angel gets done with the conversation with Mary, 
and you're going to give birth to Savior. Here is exactly what she says. She says, well, let it be to me as you said. She didn't go into a lot of logistics of how is this possible. They didn't go, they, 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 she got the answer and she went on. But she looks and the angel, looks at an angel and says, well, you know what? Let it be to me as you've said it to be. And now, 33 years later, she's standing at the foot of the cross and her firstborn is dying. And I believe in her heart, she's saying the very same thing again. Let it be to me as you have said. I've trusted. See, this is where the treasured part comes up. She has treasured all these things. We went through this, Gina and I went through this scrapbook to pull these pictures. My mom, you know, when pictures taking wasn't easy, took pictures. And she made Christmas books before scrapbooking had a name. There's something about treasuring the moments as you see the kids make these triumphs and these wins and they, they get through this thing you don't think they'll ever get through. And they get through it and you see. And there's something about that treasured moments where you can then look at, well, how have I trained them? What have I sewn into them? And I believe that when, when, when you have these treasured moments and you couple these with this consistent early and ongoing training, then you can stand at a point where it doesn't look like there's any win and you can trust God that God will complete what He starts. And what He has started in our kids, He will complete it in our kids. How do I know that? Because what was started in you, He's completing. I think in your own life you can reflect and say, I'm not where I was. Many of us would say, only by the grace of God go I. It's heartbreaking to see our kids suffer in pain. It's heartbreaking to see our kids suffer disappointment. But there comes a time where we have to trust. See, now we've taken you all the way from birth all the way up into maybe the ones going off to college. The fact of the matter is, moms, your kids leave you every day. The first day you put them on the bus and send them to school. We have video of that, by the way. For first day you put your kid on the bus to go to school. The first time they try out for something and they don't make it. How many parents would say that's a kick in the gut? See, they, they leave us little, little by little, and that's not a sad thing. When I graduated from college, when I, and I asked, I asked mom specifically, are you disappointed? I wasn't coming home. And I and I'd always came home. I was I mean that service station ran our life. Our whole family revolved around that service station. My dad owned. I worked or worked it. I ran it and 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 dad had all these plans initially was that we were going to get another one and we were going to run this business together and and I asked mom I said are you disappointed I'm not coming home? And here's what she said to me. I would be disappointed if you did come home. I didn't raise you to come home. I raised you to go serve the Lord. How was she able to trust? Well, she had already treasured and seen how God had worked in my life. She had trained consistently. She trusted in me when no one else trusted in me. And she trusted in God when things were much larger than both of us. One of my funniest memories, come on, Michael, come on up. One of my favorite memories of my mom was Annie had just been born. It was 1997, and... I'd already been in pastoral ministry now, uh, I don't, uh, 9, 10, 12 years, something like that. But I had taken a new job as the missions pastor at our church in Atlanta, which means I was going to get on an airplane, and every 30 days I was going to be in another country. And I remember talking to her, telling her about it, and she said, great. And I thought she'd be excited because she was always, mom had supported missionaries. Actually, Angie Muni's family in Italy as a missionary. So she, I thought she'd be excited, but here's what she said, just when you started getting to the age where I didn't think I have to pray for you. <laughs> Just when I thought I could get a break, I've got to get after it all over again. And I think really moms, if anything epitomizes you, is that you still have to get after it all over again. 
but not praying in fear that something's going to happen to the kids. Right? You remember the days, and you guys may still be in them, where you, the kids are so quiet in the crib, you go check and see if they're breathing? Yeah, the chuckle say yes. And those days, are, they're, they're, treasure, they're treasured days. We trust, and we grow, and we trust, and we grow. We treasure, and we train, and we trust. And you have a unique role. It's a highly valuable role. Thank you for playing it, and thank you for playing it well. Now, just kind of in conclusion, at some point in time today, I'm sure you have said or thought one of these two things. I'm no Mary, and my child is no Jesus. (laughs) Maybe you thought the latter first. I don't know. But it's interesting that why we don't have we don't have this chronicle of Jesus' upbringing because I think it would be would be worse. We'd be we'd be chasing Mary and Joseph down all the time trying to find out, and someone would be writing four books about the thirty steps that Mary did and Ray, you know, did she breastfeed? Didn't she? You know, did she go to work? Didn't she? You know, I mean, we'd have we'd have all this all this stuff, but we but we have we have enough. And the biggest thing we know about Mary is that she was highly favored of the Lord. The biggest thing we have about Mary is that she could look an angel in the face and say, be to me as you have said. We don't have a track record of Mary. We don't know if she's president of her class. She obeyed and listened to mom. And see, we have a tendency to reflect as parents and moms. You might reflect, well, you know what? I I haven't been that good. I'm not going to have a track record of Mary. She doesn't fit me. Where I want to end today is, but she can from this point forward. Our life is filled where we have to draw lines in the sand. Where we say, you know what, that was the past, and that was, but this is the future. This is the right now, and this is the future. And that's what I meant by when we have a child, it seems to knock everything off axis for a good, in a good way. Because I think it makes us reflect and go, okay, what's life about? How am I going to do this one differently? God's grace be with you. We lo- I love you. We love you. Your, your kids love you. We honor you today. And I'd like for you, our moms to stand. I'm, I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing over you as a mom. Then we're all going to stand for a benediction. Moms, no one wants to go first. Moms don't like the attention. All of our moms today. What a sight. What a sight that is, right? What a sight that is. Lord, I pray for these, for these women. Lord, maybe the, the moms that are watching online today. And Lord, we offer a heartfelt thank you. Lord, that you created, you created mom. Lord, that you've wired them and knit them together. You've made them to have the hearts that would treasure. Lord, the discipline um, to stick to the training. Lord, and I thank you for the confidence that a mom can instill in their kids. The trust that she has. So in one breath, Lord, I, I bless them in the name of Jesus. I, for the ways in which they might struggle with, am I doing it right? Am I, am I getting it right? Lord, I pray today that you would just, you would give them wisdom and grace. Lord, for those in the transition periods with their kids, Lord, give them wisdom and grace. At some point, it it transcends and it transitions to trust. And I pray let trust grow up inside of them. Lord, that they can trust what you put inside their kids. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Everybody stand. Happy Mother's Day again. Dads, um, I've already blown it today. I made no, I made no, um, no provision for lunch. Uh, today with my wife. So if anyone knows anyone, um, text me and let me know where I can get in uh, right after that second service. Um, I believe there's someone taking pictures out here. Is that, is that correct? Or something? So, so right out these double doors to the left, there's a place where you, we got set up for family pictures. And right outside under, under our porch, there's pictures as well. Okay? So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face to shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace.
you're rising up and you're laying down and you're going out and you're coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day.